Hmm. Hey, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I turn off all the microphones on my phone, and uh, I didn't use Zoom too often, you know? So I had to go back and enable a thing. Great to see you. Yeah, so you have a nice hat right there, man. Thank you. Thank you. A friend of mine gave it to me. <laughs> pr pr pronounce the name of the city for me, CrossFit. Bamian. Bamian. Yeah. Am I saying it right? Bamian? Yep. yep. Sounds, Ar sounds Armenian. Yeah, almost. Not quite, but not too Bamian. far from that. Yeah. Max, you own the only CrossFit gym in Afghanistan. Correct. And you have seven kids. So far, yeah. Right, right. Sorry, I don't mean to limit you. I apologize. The way I worded that is like you were done. No, that was very rude no, of me. Contemptuous. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. No. Yeah, you, we, we. You and I met uh, several years ago on the CrossFit podcast. Yep. And um, you have five kids, and then you have a set of twins, five singles, and then a double. Yep. Yeah, surprise package. <sighs> How are you? Oh, we're doing pretty good. Yeah, with uh, all the craziness, conservative speaking, pretty good. And um, you're you're in the United States now. Yeah, so far for uh, two days, thir twelfth, thirteenth, another eleven days. And then you go back to your gym in Afghanistan. Yep. How's the gym doing? It's doing pretty good. It was closed, government closed. You know, when uh, it's a little bit different levels how they close stuff there. Uh, in uh, April, government came, soldiers came and closed the gym and not allowed anybody to come. And by that time, we were already out because my father-in-law passed away. So we, we got out of the country and tried to go back in, and then the whole thing got shut down. And the gym got closed by government for two months, and then they opened. Now it had no restrictions, no nothing there. So everything is going as normal. And uh, we're almost back to the 100% of our capacity like we were running before. It took a few months. When you say you went back, did you actually physically try to go back or you were just doing the preparations to go back? I was trying to go back. And the uh, day when I decided to purchase the tickets to go back, uh, all the countries got shut down. And there, there were no flight, no flights to Afghanistan. And the State Department emailed me about the uh, flights that they arranged in there to get the Americans out. <laughs> so when you travel... You travel with seven kids and a wife. There's nine mm -hmm. of you. Yeah, one wife. You know, one in Afghanistan, wife. in Afghanistan, they will ask you how many wives you have. <laughs> the only one. Maybe I'm talking. <laughs> so, so I'm just trying. So, do you have just incredible patience? Like, like, like mm -hmm. I let's. I'm in the car and I have three kids. <laughs> and I have this, like, I have this order that I do things and I don't want anyone messing with me. Right. They're all seat belted in. Mm -hmm. They each get out one by one. I make sure their shoes are on. I then wipe their faces. <laughs> I have this like protocol. If, if one guy jumps out of the van ahead of schedule or the grandparents come and interfere, the whole thing goes to chaos. You can't. Oh, yeah. So I'm just trying to imagine with seven, like what happens if do you have like some strict protocols like that? I mean, are you like a drill sergeant? How do you keep, how do you move seven kids through an airport? Yeah, I mean, because we've been traveling for a while, you know, my kids understand that when we're in a public place, there is the different level of uh, of behavior supposed to be in the way that you stay more diligent and the more aware of the things. You know, it's not like I'm going to kill you for that, but uh, like in Afghanistan, you know, you have to be next to the family, right next to us, and you there is no step away from that. You know, when you go to the Western countries, you know, we kind of relax a little bit more, but we're still, because we're in a public place, we still keep it tight. And then uh, with kids, what I learned that you have to give them, you have to be strict with them, but you have to find a place where you give them freedom. Because if you're going to be constantly strict in them, you're going to crush their spirit and they're going to be mad at you and they snacks or anything in the, and another day, you just let let him have it, let it rip. <laughs> when I spent some t a little time in Syria, I spent a little time in Turkey, I spent a lot of time in Lebanon. Um, those are the Middle Eastern countries I was in. Especially Lebanon felt very, 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 very safe. 
it, yeah, just, it, um, they didn't have the kind of crime that we have. They kind of have this street mentality. They have a mob. They had a mob there when I was there and basically yeah. they took care of the streets. So the people doing the crime, everyone knew who they were. Right. But they also protected the streets. You know, they, they didn't have, it was safe for the children. There weren't kidnappings or rapes or just, it, it just seemed like a safe place. Is, is Afghanistan like that? Is it a safe place for kids? No, our kids, when they go on outside, they uh, play when I'm outside. I have to have my eyes on them. And uh, if local kids want to play with our kids, they come to our yard and play. And if we go somewhere, they all will lose together. Because <laughs> because in Afghanistan, in uh, we as a foreigners, we're standing out, you know. And but uh, they have a rampant kidnapping. Even if if especially if you're from wealthy family, I mean, ransom is the good income. So that's often happens in you know, relatives, circles, and stuff. So it's it's a little bit different than Lebanon. I understand. Wow, wow, yeah, that's stressful. How long have you been in Afghanistan? That's four and a half years almost. And what? How old is your youngest child? Uh, next month gonna be seven. Two of them gonna be seven. Okay, so you had all your children before you uh -huh. you started the business. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's, it's remarkable. Do you talk about it every day? Does someone ask you every day if you go outside with your kids? Is it, I mean, it's, is it's a scene everywhere, right? Even with my three oh, yeah. boys, I feel like it's a scene. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. We, it's, it's especially for us, you know, in the Afghanistan, you can't see foreigners with kids because if you work for government, you're not allowed. If you work for NGOs, non-government organizations, you're not allowed to bring a family or kids. And then here we are with the kids, you know, and I was uh, last year, I think, we went to U.S. Embassy, and we're walking out, and it's quite a hike, about the mile next to the big fence, you know, where they're heavily guarded. And there was uh, two local guys walking, and they were talking the local language, you know, and they say, oh, they work in the embassy, and says, man, we work in the embassy for three years, and then we never see little Americans. We thought they were big right away. <laughs> And then we, we understood and I started talking to them and they got a little bit embarrassed, but then we, <laughs> because we understood everything, you know, but how, the, that's, for them, it's a shock to see little kids, you know, how, how old's your oldest child? 16, just turned 16. And a boy or a girl? Boy, yeah. yeah. We have five boys and two girls. Have any of them expressed to you that they want to, that, to come to the United States or, or back to your homeland of the Ukraine? Uh, homeland is heaven, Sivan. You know, okay. uh, we go we go back to Afghanistan. Afghanistan, it's not home. We go to Ukraine, it's not home. And uh, even this time, we're coming to U.S. and uh, I don't recognize home of the brave, the land of the free. Is that uh, even such a thing left? <laughs> I understand the sentiment. <laughs> so, but uh, some of them, you know, some of them, my few, my boys love football. You know, American football and. Uh, they play in, uh, they play in at home, you know, and they don't play uh, touch, you know, two hand touch. They play full tackle, you know, and usually it goes until somebody gets severely hurt and then game dissolves. <laughs> so some of them want to come back, and we are sensitive, trying to stay sensitive with that, and uh, we'll see what future holds for us. But uh, we're looking. We have a, we always have opportunities to come back. We always have opportunities to get them involved in everything. But like uh, this year. You know, with the with the thing that's going on right now, you, you don't even know what's what's open, what's not open. School open two t two times a week. What's the purpose of going to school? You know, and uh, everything else. So, I I have two three year olds and a five year old, and one of my friends was hanging out with me for a few days, and he said, "Hey, I did the math, and one of your kids is crying every eight minutes." <laughs> Uh, ours are a little bit older, so they don't cry as often now. <laughs> but there must have been a time when it seemed like someone was always crying, right? Someone's always oh, getting yeah. like punched in the face or tripped or oh, their yeah. hair gets caught in a toy or, I mean, something's yeah. always happening, right? Oh, yeah. Somebody got hurt. You know, it's always, uh, we have a few kids who are emotionally sensitive and physically not sensitive. So they always go in at it. One is joking, another answering with the fists, you know, and they both crying because they both got hurt. <laughs> And uh, I saw a picture of you putting the kids in the in your car with the three car seats. I remember those times. I remember we had a five car seats in the car. That was <laughs> cleaning, vacuuming, the car was an everyday deal. Because if you don't, if you miss a day, it's too bad. 
It's a, it's a giant pit of crumbs and food. Even though we have a no eating rule in the car, our car is full of food. I don't know how that happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, five car seats. What kind of car was that? Uh, uh, we had a first. We had a minivan, and uh, then we got the Chevy Express, fifteen passenger van. And is that yeah. is that the ideal car for a big family? Uh, depends on you or what you want to do. You know, we found out that. Uh, Right now we have an excursion, diesel excursion, because I like diesels, I like power. And uh, it's nine seats, and so we all the seats are busy. And if we're in the States, it's nice for us to travel, but the problem is when you want to take friends, you know, along, that's the problem. You know, in the, in Afghanistan, that's not a problem, because I, 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 my wife has a video, like we were driving there and the kids go on the roof rack. I guess it's all dirt roads, you know, and we were, we're driving on a ridge, there and the kids yeah can i get in the roof right well climb in and the four of them were sitting there as we're going on the ridges there in the mountains <laughs> <laughs> you're doing it as the locals do it yeah max when you you met your wife in the united states no in no ukraine. no in ukraine that's right okay and then you guys um got married and came to the united states and had your first yep. child here yep no we have uh, two kids in ukraine okay we, we, we came came over here come over here to for visits and everything but we we still live in Ukraine. We had two kids there and then we moved to the U.S. When um, I, I met my wife in college in my 20s, maybe mm -hmm. er, er, early 20s, very, very early 20s. And um, she, we, quickly we knew, you know, oh, we were just friends for five years before we started dating. I was pursuing her for yeah. forever. But um, we knew right away we would never get married and we would never have kids. You know, we talked <laughs> about it openly. And then you know, things changed. When you and your wife met, tell yeah. me about the um, conversations about having kids. Do you, do, you, do you know that your mate wants a lot of kids or is it something that just evolves? So uh, I grew up with uh, three more siblings. So in my family, it's four kids and my wife, same, same situation, you know. And uh, when I was growing up, my parents, they would go and pick up kids from orphanage on the weekends. And we had a random kids spend the weekends or holidays with us you know and from a young age for me it was the kids were the one of the big values for me and for same thing for my wife there she loves kids you know so when we got married before we got married we talked about that a lot and for us it's kind of funny when people say oh i'm married but i don't know if i never asked my wife if she wanted any kids because, <laughs> because, because i was wondering what the people talking about when they're dating you know so we date for four years and we talk about kids a lot. And we decided we're going to have minimum of four. And, uh, but uh, one day my wife, my wife uh, was praying and she asked God and God told her seven. And she was okay. She didn't tell me that, but I'm okay with that. You know? So, and uh, when we had our five, we were pretty happy. You know, <laughs> we, we achieve our goal and surpassed it. <laughs> and uh, our house was in order and everything. And then, we had twins later on, and that was change. <laughs> twins bring a completely different dynamic, you know? <laughs> I, I want to get to that. Um, so that's remarkable. So your wife was, it was kind of, for your wife, it was a blessing and a curse to have the twins because she knew she was done. Oh, I got the seven that God promised me. <laughs> no, but <laughs> right? that, that's the thing is that the, she, we had five and the, uh, uh, when we got pregnant, we thought we we had only one. It's 2013, and uh, we are on our way to Afghanistan at that time. And I thought, ah, oh, we have one. That's okay. We we'll, we can have anywhere in the world. And then we find out we're already on the other side, and we find out we have twins. So we had to come back and had twins here. And uh, she said that uh, before twins, she never f felt fulfilled that we have an, all of our kids, you know. And after seven, she says, I'm feeling good. But we're still looking for adoption. We, we want to adopt a few. You know, it's just a little bit hard with uh, with the situation in the world now, with the papers and everything, and with our lives. So when everything's settling a little bit, we'll do it. When I spoke to you, you actually said, I don't want to misquote you, so feel free to take uh -huh. this back if I heard it wrong or correct me. Um, you said having the twins, twins was more difficult than the first five, more challenging. Oh, yeah. oh, how, yeah. how is That's that possible? You tell me that and I'm thinking, that stuck with me. That was so profound you said that. And I'm like, wow, how can that be? 
So with R5, Sivan, I start. I was working as a mechanical engineer, and I got up and go to work at five o'clock in the morning. My wife would get up at four thirty and make me bre uh, breakfast, and I would head out. You know, I never woke up with any kids in the middle of the night. And with twins, I changed, and I lost my sleep. I still didn't have it, you know, because uh, suddenly she has to nurse two kids, and one of the twins was not nursing, neither gave a bottle and everything. So I remember elbow in my ribs in the middle of the night, Max, help me out here. <laughs> you know, and that's how it started, because, you know, two kids, it's pretty hard to handle it changing diapers and when they both crying and everything it's it's difficult you know so i yeah. got more involved i got more involved in the, those kind of stuff than before yeah the sleepless nights are pretty uh with twins are pretty amazing <laughs> but they, you know now they're almost seven years old and uh, it's completely different that's the beginning stages that's the difficult most difficult part and as older they get you enjoy watching them how they grown how you know, twins, they have a three minutes or minute, 45 seconds apart and how different they are. <laughs> you know, we have a, my youngest is a boy. He's a math whiz. You know, he is so smart with numbers and my, uh, his, his sister is a little bit older, you know, she, she will be artistic, but math for her is so hard, you know, and uh, when they do, you know, when we work out, she's a pretty athletic and she's, but she's careful and she's athletic and uh, she don't like running or anything. She likes to do some gymnastic stuff and uh, like your boys do. And my youngest, he would run, he's thin and he loves running. Any workout with run, he will be running, you know? <laughs> so so, are, so all, are all your kids crossfitting? They all crossfit. Yeah, we still call it crossfit, not fit, crossfit. And we still do it in that. <laughs> I'm just poking you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. I tell people who don't who who ask me about twins, and and I I, I try to say it humbly, but shit, it's just me and you here. Um, the difference between twins and one baby is the fact that it's like getting two kittens or two puppies. You mm -hmm. see play and you see interaction that's like oh, yeah. beyond priceless. Oh it's yes. Like, I mean, um, you almost feel bad for feel bad is not the right word yeah, everyone 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 should get twins i mean it is a remarkable thing to see two kids interact and my kids have been in the from the wound to every night of their night slept in the same bed together and i kind of trip yeah. on that too that they don't know a world apart from each other oh yeah yeah but you see we had a five kids five under five so oh. they're not twins wait five under five yeah and your wife birthed them all that they were yeah. all her, your bait, no adoptions in those no, five? No. no. <laughs> so, okay, go on. <laughs> oh my God. So we start, our first kid was in 2004 and uh, 2005. 2006, we, six, we had a uh, miscarriage and seven, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so they're really close to each other, all our kids. And uh, when we, we decide we want more kids, uh, we thought if we're going to have one, we need to have another one because between youngest and the twins, it's five years, you know, and I grew up between me and my father, my brother, four years, we are four years apart. And we noticed that the four years is a gap that the, you grew up apart, you know, right. you siblings, right. but you're not the good, great friends. Right. So if you are three years and lower, to, uh, you know, gap, age gap, it's much better. You become more friends. You, you, you have a similar friends. You have a similar interests, you know, and you kind of have a life together. And when we had twins, before we knew that we had twins, we thought it's one. We thought we we're going to have to have another baby right away that they can have, you know, playmates and everything. Like you said, it hurts to see a single kid, you know, the only child on the screen all the time and dumbified by all the worldly stuff that this. take your brains away from you. <laughs> What are, what are the sleeping arrangements with your kids? Do, do they share a bed? Like my three boys, we have two bedrooms, but my three boys sleep every night together. We put them in a king size bed. They just want to sleep together. Oh yeah. They, it depends. Like right now we are traveling right now. We're in Utah and uh, we're in a one big kids in all one big room. We have a uh, three air mattresses there. We have a uh, three kids in one, two kids, in another one and two kids, in another one. 
And, and do, are they paired up the same every night? Do those three that sleep together, are they the team? Or no, well, they, they move around? Sometimes they, sometimes they miss. You know, in Afghanistan, we have a, uh, one room for, for two kids. And uh, ironically, that my oldest is the messiest one. And, my, and the second boy, he's a neat, neat freak. You know, he's like military. He, everything arranges. He, he's like, a, his room is like a museum. He has the all decorated. He makes his bed in, every morning. And if you sit in the bed, he will yell at you and he will fix it and make you get up. So you walk in the room and you have a room like a, like a kingdom split in the half. You have a mess, you know, clothes all over the place in one half of the room. And the second half of it is perfectly clean or in order. <laughs> You know, so if you have two kids per room in Afghanistan, you have seven kids. So you have a uh, four bedroom house, five bedrooms. Yeah. Uh, so we have a, uh, our oldest girl, she got, she scored a room by herself. Uh -huh. So twins together and the, all the boys in the two. So it's the four rooms. Yeah. And then we have a room. Yeah. Do all when you look at all seven of your kids, can you look at them and be like, okay, this one's my wife, this one's me, this one's 50 50, this one? I mean, do you see are they all of you and your wife, or is there one that or two that you're like, hey, what planet did you come from? Are you sure we're your parents? Like, they're just totally off that you can't recognize them, not really. They all kind of look like, like us and but, their behaviors. Uh, oh, they did, but hold on back to the look, okay, but yeah. we have a we have a seven kids and I love brown eyes. I love brown eyes. And we had only one kid with the brown eyes. So uh -huh. <laughs> we can't, definitely can see that, that that's my wife. You know, there's a, I'm there, but not as much as my wife. <laughs> and uh, that's always funny. You know, you look at the kids and they, they look the same, but the one is stand out all the time. Like, yeah. like, like, like what, um, one of my kids is always gesticulating. He's always waving his hands uh -huh. the way I'm always waving my hands. Uh -huh. Or one of my, one of my boys is like always in deep thought, you know, like my wife. And, and when I see these things, I'm like, Oh, there I am. Oh, there's my wife. Oh, oh yeah. And it just must be just constantly like that with you, huh? Oh yeah. And, uh, you know, and the funny thing is when you look at them, they all have a, you look, Oh yeah, that's my wife. But yet it's something different also, you know, it's not only my wife, it's, there's a little bit of me and the, its own personality, kids' personality adds right. the flavor and it becomes so unique. And they're pretty cool to see how they view things. You know, some of our kids are pretty mechanical. You know, we have one kid that will fix anything. I mean, we had a blender in uh, in in Afghanistan. We bought the blender that the only blender they have in the whole city for ten dollars. And sure enough, it lasted because the ten dollars last, you know, <laughs> one use, and all the gears got stripped off. So my kid took it apart, took the motor off, put the zip ties, put the whole motor on the pipe, and made a weedy rather thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, and the other kids, you know, they really into decoration. They like make it look things pretty. And another kid don't even care, you know. <laughs> just some kids pretty regiment about showers, you know, shower time every morning or every evening they take showers. And some, if you're not gonna be on them, they can go without shower for a week. Right, right. <laughs> hey, you smell like a stinky dog. Oh, I forgot to take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you mentioned your wife had a you your wife had a miscarriage. How many babies did you have before that happened? We had two kids, and then we had a miscarriage. Then we had uh, our rest of the three, and then we had a miscarriage too after our, all our five. And uh, that was one of the hardest things we did because it was a uh, second trimester, second trimester miscarriage, and uh, we she has to go to the hospital and uh, she has to give birth. And I hold my son; it was 15, uh, 15 weeks old, completely formed. My son was laying on my head end you know and that was pretty pretty hard so that's one of the things that kind of put the damper on our desire for more kids for a while so um the first time my wife was pregnant she had a miscarriage then we had avi mm -hmm. then she had another miscarriage and although i didn't experience what you experienced she started when she started bleeding it was pretty bad and i put her in the bathtub at the house mm -hmm. and i would mm -hmm. just check on her every you know minute or sitting there with her and then one time i went in there and she was losing consciousness so i rushed her to the, i rushed her to the hospital i think yeah. it was only um 12 or 13 weeks i never I, I never saw any sign of the baby um but yeah that's and that's why i asked because basically that physically 
um, that physically did something to her. Her skin was like yellow for like nine months. She lost so much really? blood. She lost so much blood in the bathtub. Yeah. And she just kind of wasn't herself. And I yeah. think she, it, um, it scared her too. Right. Oh yeah. And, and so you know, she, the, the, the ladies going th through this stuff different than we do, you know, their hormones change and the, the like our first one, it was the six weeks, you know, really beginning. And she, I didn't, I didn't even see it, you know, it just right. blood in the toilet, and that's it. Right. And uh, that was a baby, you know. And uh, for her, she, it took her a while to recover from that. Like you said, it, she, she was different, you know, for yeah. a while. And I didn't think we were gonna have the twin. I thought she, she was done. She was like, hey, that's it. You know, like it, mm -hmm. you could tell it, it, it physically and emotionally like rocked her. Yeah. But but we got but she got pregnant again and yeah yeah hey, that's that's amazing that's that's pretty cool how how old was your wife when she had the twins thirty three and are are they identical no they're fraternal it's a, yeah it's the born a girl yeah. okay it's right the, yeah they're usually different yeah. So that, that's the same with, um, with my twins. They're fraternal. Oh. And the oh. doctor told us that that was pretty common, or shall I say not uncommon, with women who are over 35 because they start dropping multiple eggs. Did you yeah, hear anything like that? Oh, yeah. That's what, that's what we have to be careful afterwards. <laughs> you don't want to get the triplet with our success rate. <laughs> so it's funny you say that because my wife threatens me. She says, "Hey, you better be careful. I swear to God, I'll give you triplets." But she, but she doesn't know that I would love some triplets. I would love to get three girls to match my three boys. You see, I wanted my girl to be a brown eyes, you know, like my wife and everything. But I got the blue eye girl. <laughs> but I, I'm, ha I'm happy. You know, it's it's wonderful to have them. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, talk, they talk about the back to the pregnancy. They talk about that the older you get, more chances of, uh, because she didn't have in her family history, she didn't have any twins or anything, you know? So they talk about that the uh, older you get, more chances you get uh, to get pregnant with twins and more. Max, you go to church every Sunday? <clears throat> See one? What? It's an, another sore subject about church now. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. well, but we can talk. No, we. I, I'm. We, we just travel thirteen thousand miles across the U.S. Yeah. You know, we've been in different states, and we went to the churches that are open. Okay. You know? Um. Okay. For that reason, gotcha. The reason why I ask is this: How? Um, how does someone do you do you introduce your kids to religion? Do you introduce your kids to God? Do you like it? I, it's such a, um, uh, a a spot for me that I have no um, awareness of. My only my my parents used to take me to church. My dad was um, studied to be a, a priest. He went to a missionary school in high school, um, and my dad goes to church on Sundays now. But as a child, I only went on Easter and Christmas and like some special Armenian events. Yeah. And so, and, 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 um, and now my sister's very religious. She goes to church every Sunday. Yeah. So I don't have that. I'm not bringing my kids up like that. So it's yeah. an interesting, and I feel like it's a piece of their life that they're missing. Right. Yeah. If, if for not for the spiritual reasons, for the cultural reasons, I'm glad culturally, like I'm glad I went to, my parents took me to church. Oh yeah. yeah. Do you, is it just, is it something you introduced to your kids or no? It's just like showering and eating and it's just something that they've always done. Uh, First of all, we don't view religion uh, as the rule, you know, as the thing that you must do. We view our faith as a part of who we are and how we do things, you know. And uh, for us to go to church, it's normal. But like this time, I told you we're going to go to church. In the last moment, the kids were tired, so we decided not to go to church. So we did church at home, you know, it, it, because it's not about only – to do to go and uh, go to church and uh, see people, people see you and then come back, sit, sit there and listen and come back home. You know, because at the end of the day, that's what religion does. It cares how you look and what you do. You know, some people say you're a religious man if you go to church every Sunday. But uh, is it religious? Yes, you know how to keep the rules, but where is your heart is? That's the bigger question. That's where we're in Afghanistan that we, we uh, uh, battle a lot with that 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 the kind of thing that religious you know they they understand religion their own religion and they hate it with passion 
but they will do it because of a culture, you know. And uh, with our kids, we raise them that it's part of our life and they see us every day and they see good moments, bad moments, and we see who, they see who God is for us. You know, it's not something that a guy speaks on Sunday about. It's everyday thing, you know. And that's how we raise them. And the culture, uh, culture is important, like especially in you, you Armenian, and uh, these cultures are really, really important. You know, if you want your kids to, to be exposed to that, you know. Like we go to, when we fly to Afghanistan, we go through Ukraine and uh, they understand Ukrainian culture, you know. They don't necessarily like everything about that, but they understand, oh, this is Ukraine, you know. You, that's what you expect in Ukraine. <laughs> so in the church, it's a good place to, to introduce them to it, you know. You used, I, I was going to ask you this question um, and feel free to rework it because I don't know if it's, a, if it's a correct question. I'm making some presuppositions about you. Was your faith always there or did you have a moment that it was born or that it was ignited? And if so, if there was a moment that it was ignited, does it ha- are you, will that happen to your kids too? Or mm-hmm. so th- does that I, question I, make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was born in Soviet union and in Soviet union, there was a state church that, uh, that the priest was a KGB guy. <laughs> who keeps track of who's coming, who's going, and uh, what your business is <laughs> of a good religious people, you know. And uh, then the missionaries came to our town, and uh, that's when I start going to church. That's when I know. Uh, then I realized who God is, and that's how my life started. I was seven years old, and me and my dad went to church, and we got saved, and our lives changed, you know. And uh, my dad was he he was a different man after that. So that's what happened for me. And you always have a lows and highs, you know. There's not the, not a, every every day you feeling high, you know, and flying high. Some days you barely cr- crawling, but the whole thing, like in the Bible says that the, uh, what's the, uh, wicked, r- righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up and keeps going on, and the wicked one falls down and no more, <laughs> you know. That's the whole thing that you get up because you have a hope, you have a something to look for, you have a reason to get up in the morning, and uh, go there and do and uh, raise your kids and everything. Because if you look at the life, it's pretty hopeless, especially now. <laughs> so many stuff happened, and uh, with kids, they all have uh, this this kind of moments in different times of their life. You know, some of them already had, some of them they kind of live in with us and they're looking at everything and it's their decision. You know, I'm not going to impose or anything. It's between them and God, not between them and me. Yeah. So you saw your father go through a transformation and that was, and that was your personal spark. Yeah. No, I, I mean, God touched my heart mm-hmm. first. When I came to church, I felt his presence in my, you know, it's not, it's more than even at seven, that, even at seven, at seven years old. Yeah. My, 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 my wife got baptized at four at four years old and that she felt God when she, you know, that's whole thing. She wanted. It's about experiencing God, not only knowing him. If you look in the West on American culture, we kind of know about God, but we have no experience with him. And that's where we have uh, so many color problems and everything else, you know, it's just stupid. Right. Because people have a knowledge, but no experience. There's this, um, sort of this cliche story right the the kids with the religious parents and mm-hmm. then the and then the kids rebel mm-hmm. um and and you know I, I saw that in school you know oh yeah the, the kids who were uh, um you could even say more mischievous right oh yeah how do you how do you is there truth to that and how do you manage that as a parent how do, how do you how do you have your kids be a part of this and see this religious life but also not not follow that cliche route yeah, we try to stay sensitive to our kids. And the uh, reality is that it's not only uh, Christian kids or religious kids. It's any. That's why the wild parties in colleges happen, right? right. Because kids at home, they all control the environment. And then when the freedom hits the fan, <laughs> it, it's been hard. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's for us that, that we tell kids, you know, we don't have an age when you can date or not date. You know, it's all about a relationship between you and us. I want to, if guy likes you or you like the boy, whatever it is, whoever you are, we want to have a relationship with you that you can feel free to come and talk to us. You know, if you want to do something, that we'll, 
we want to have a communication between us open, you know, and that's what we're trying to do with our kids. And with some of our, we have seven of them, and the, and the older they, they are, they, they have a different characters. And for some of them, it's pretty hard to stay open. They're more like introverts, and they try to be close, you know, and then you can see trouble is brewing, you know, too much time on a screen. And uh, then you see the kids start disconnected with you, and uh, you pull back, and they get in mad. And, but it's like a circles. But the whole thing, you want to stay connected with the kid, with the child. There will be a personal connection. You know, not rules, some kind of religious or your moral rules that you want to do, but you want to have a connection, heart to heart connection. That's the biggest thing. That's how we navigate that. You have seven and I have three, even with three, some mornings I wake up and I, and I feel, or I hear my mind tells me, Hey, today you need to spend a little bit of time with Ari. Make sure you put, you know, 20 minutes aside and do Legos with him or go out in the backyard with him and yeah. prune a tree or, you know what I mean? I need, I just, just sense it. Oh yeah. Um, and I, and I, if I don't do that, I'll feel like I'm neglecting my child. Like I just, cause there's three, it's hard. How do you yeah. do that with seven? Do you have any uh, management tools? Are you like, okay, today I really have to spend some time with Sally. I haven't talked to her like in a week. I mean, with yeah, seven, so, right? Yeah. With, uh, again, it depends on the kid and the, you don't want to do like right now in the States, squeaky wheel gets the, gets grease, right? You don't want right. to get, get to that point. And then you try to navigate that and they try to look at the kids and what they need. And uh, with some kids, it's easier. With some kids, it's harder. And uh, with, when we're in the States, we just spend time together. We, we do things. And uh, I'm changing, you know, guy who, kid who want to fix things. I go and help him on his project. Then, and, uh, you know, I either want to play football or jump on the trampoline. I try to do that with him. For me, hardest is to my, is to play Minecraft because I don't understand stupid <laughs> Minecraft or Clash of Clans. I, I don't get this stuff. So for me, that that was the most challenging. But when we're in Afghanistan, what we do because we can't go on uh, dates much, you know, we can't go out for coffee or anything. Uh, we spend every week we have on the calendar every week one child stay up with us in. Uh, so everybody go to bed early at eight o'clock ish or something, eight thirty, or at least they're in their bed, you know, bedrooms and they're not bothering us. And with that special kid, we do whatever they want to do. We watch the movie, we, we bake cookies, we make chocolate milk, we talk, we play board games, you know. And so that's how that's how we do and staying connected, you know. Oh my god, yeah. I love that. And you have seven kids in seven days. Oh yeah. No, no, no. Hold on. We do one kid a week. One kid oh, a week. one kid a week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I was going to say a that's week. a lot of chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. I like my <laughs> wife. So I, I like to spend time with her. And I usually it's when kids, that's one of the thing with the, when you have a seven kids, you have to stay connected with your wife because between a regular life and the seven kids, you know, life gets away from you. And at the end of the day, you lay down with, in the bed with your wife. And you don't want to lay down with a stranger. You want to lay down with a person who your friend and you still can talk instead of just barking at each other, you know? Right. That's a, another relationship that you have to maintain. <laughs> you have seven kids and um, do you treat them all the same? Or are there different rules for different kids? Do some kids get away with more? Like I noticed my, my child who's the most verbal one of the twins, he gets away with murder because he just knows how to negotiate. And so like, you know, the other kids, you tell them to go to your room and they just go to their room and then you take them in there and get them dressed or do whatever you're going to do in there. And he's like, well, how about I go in two minutes? And you're like, you know, he throws a, <laughs> a wrench in the loop. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, we have a, our fifth kid. He's a jokester. So we tell kids, okay, kids, mom and dad made a meal. You guys clean up. So everybody's working and he's standing there and talking his head off everybody laughing and he's not moving a finger while everybody else is working <laughs> he's the entertainment yep yep and uh, the rest of the kids okay with that <laughs> you know i'm looking at this man that's not right and, and they said no dad he's keeping us company he's making us laugh <laughs> so we have those kids <laughs> yeah i like that i like your flexibility it's really a um it's it, it's it's really it's really remarkable um, dealing with kids and just how much um, I, I call it space you need to make and in oh. and, and, and the most superficial sense when people say what does that mean you give your kids space I say it's staying silent 
But yeah. in the in the practice, it's really you just turn into an observer. Oh you're yeah. You just you just have to. Sometimes you want to interact, but it's better you just be quiet and watch, and they know you're there, and you kind of just have to let things play out, right? It oh, would have yeah. been easy for you to say, "Hey, what was what was your son's name? The one who is the jokester?" Seth. It would have been easy to say, "Seth, get in there and do some work. I'm tired of this bullshit." Blah blah blah. But instead, you 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 made space, right? Yeah. And you observe, and and it's fine. And, and the, like raising kids, you know, I wish there would be manual. When kid is born, he comes up with a manual. You know, that's my character. That's the <laughs> <laughs> that's the benefits. What how you how would I react? Like a, you know. To discipline kids, there's so many different ways to discipline them. For some, spanking works like a magic. For some, raising voice works like a magic. For some, rewards work like a magic, you know. And you have to figure out which kid is what, you know. And, uh, and uh, you can't figure that thing out without being next to them and observe. Like you said, be quiet and watch who they are. You know, and my wife is more sensitive than me, so I'm a little bit more hard-headed. So she sometimes says, hey, Max, you have to be quiet now. Let, let him talk. And I <laughs> zip up and, <laughs> you know, at the end I see benefit, but sometimes it's hard, you know. But you live and learn. You live and learn. Hopefully people tell us, Max, why don't you write a book? I said, when my kids are gone from home and they're all doing good, I might do that. But now I'm in a process. <laughs> Max, where will you um... – where will you hang your hat? Where will you, um, where will you and your wife be when all the kids move out of the house? What's the uh, end I game? I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I love United States of America. It's my home right now. And, uh, but I hate the uh, American dream with uh, passion, you know, because people get in a rut race and try to pay the bill because bills, because they try to be, look like neighbors or somebody, you know, I'm okay to buy myself a pickup truck and a fifth wheel in between our five, seven kids to travel around and visit them. You know, I'm okay with that. I don't need my space. <laughs> so I, I don't know, Savannah. I wish I would know. Um, between my own personal experience, the stories of my dad and the story you shared with me um, the first time we met, um, I'd like to put into context your appreciation for the United States for people who don't understand it. Cause it's really oh. important. You mentioned on the first podcast we did together that in the Ukraine, not every, there's not jobs for everyone. Oh yeah. You can't just go out and get a job. Oh yeah. And you said, no matter how bad your situation is in the United States, you can go out and get a job. Oh, yeah. And that's something that people here in this country take for granted that most mm -hmm. of the world cannot take for granted. And, th and they oh, don't yeah. realize the, the blessing, the, how amazing it is that we can actually take personal accountability and responsibility for our lives here, which oh, yes. is almost impossible in some other countries. Oh, and yes. instead of embracing that ability to take personal accountability, they shirk it. They want mm -hmm. more. They poo poo it. And I know it just because of the stories my dad would tell me about growing up in Lebanon. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it personally because you experienced it in yes. um, the Ukraine growing up as a boy. Right. Yeah. It was and, just uh, a, living, and, and living in Afghanistan currently. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, at least there you have a business. In the Ukraine, it was, it, as I recall, it was just a hustle, right? It was oh, one yeah. hustle. It was by any means necessary to scrap oh, yeah. a few dollars together and get food for the family, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a time. <laughs> but you see, people would don't. One thing that I love about the United States, how it started. You know, there are bad things that happen, like always, you know, there's, but the people left their homes, they came all the way across the ocean, and a number of people in the beginning died. And I guess what happened with next people, they still came, even though there's disease, there's everything else. And right now, people are afraid of everything, you know, fear that thing has gripped everybody and everybody want to be safe. What is safe? You know, what is safe, you know, in a socialism, I call it socialism, communism, whatever it is creeping in. And a, nobody want to take responsibility for me. You know, I working out every day. I eat good. You know, I take care of my body for me. So why in the world did I have to put the mask f for you if you don't take care of yourself? <laughs> you know, that's the pure form of, of communism. That's how I grew up. That's people tell me, put the mask for me. It's you. Take care of yourself. Why did you? I'm, I know I'm healthy, you know. 
you know, we can go on and on about it, but people want to free stuff and they don't want to pay for that. That's the bottom line. And they don't understand there is no such a thing as free. They want a bigger and better that's, that somebody else will pay for that. There's the flip side of the coin also. There's this presumption that you're being selfish by not wearing a mask. But you also have to be able to flip the script and see the other side that if you're not taking care of yourself, you're also being selfish by sort of crippling civilization. Oh, yeah. So if you're drinking soda pop every day um, and you didn't realize it, you actually are crippling civilization. You're actually oh, yeah. the, the, you're the weak link. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so you have to see both. You, ha you, have, you can't just blame people for not wearing masks. You have to see, hey, look at all of these weak links. These are things yeah. that people could easily take, um, could fix. Yeah. Um, yeah, by just showing some some discipline. But you see, for me, if, uh, right now, what's the problem is it's a fear in people. Yeah. There's no no rational rationality. There is no reason, rhyme and reason, but the feelings. That's what matters. If you you experience with the cancel culture, mm -hmm. if you sound bad, sure did, sure did. That's that's mean you're a bad person. If you uh, say if you saying good things. And doing bad things that's me a good person you know yes. it's really how i feel you know it doesn't matter what you do if it's good or bad how i feel if i feel bad how you talk you're a bad person right and that's irritating you know and uh it, ooh. <sighs> I need <to> calm <laughs> it gets um, me going. max can i zoom with you when you're in afghanistan oh uh, yeah i okay. never try zoom but i we always skype or uh whatsapp and stuff or okay tele Telegram is the best so far. You know, that's the, the most encrypted and the bad guys even use that. So what is it called? T Telegram? Telegram. Yeah. It's one of the most secure messaging things. I, I would love to do video with you when you're there and you show us sort of like the yard and the living conditions and yeah. what you eat and the whole, yeah. whole shebang. Yeah, we can do that. So we're flying in on 26. It's going to take us a while to get there. And uh, we're going to spend a week or something in Kabul. We have to renew our license, a business license and visas there. And then in the beginning of November, we'll, we'll be back in, in our home, hopefully. Uh, uh, anything you'd like to share with parents? Any advice, any wisdom um, before we end this? With parents, yeah. S spend time with kids. You know, Don't give them stupid screens because screens are dumbified people especially now like you and me on the zoom right you see for you and me right now a perfect zoom opportunity you in one state i'm in another state and we still stay connected but when i see that the grand grandparents cannot see their grandkids because of a fear because of something that's bad you know and you give them zoom thing you have to have a connection with kids with people you know and uh, that's one of the big values in our family that's connection between parents and kids between kids and other people adults you know our kids can be they can sit with us in a conversation with adults and uh, engage in that you know they're not going to be dumbified by screen and uh, you know or or can't talk or anything and that's the thing you you want to do that you want to build relation with kids and help them our job as a parents to raise the successful adults <laughs> that's our job and, and, and tell me, what does that mean, successful adults? They will not be losers. <laughs> no. See, th this way they can, they, first of all, they know who they are. You know, because all of us, we struggle with the thing, especially when we hit teenage years. What, what is our purpose? What are we supposed to do? And when you raise kids with uh, understanding who they are, they know they, self, they have a self-confidence. They can go for the burgers when there is no other jobs and they're not being feeling bad because they have a master's degree and suddenly they have no job, but you know, they, they, they can do that stuff. There's no jobs too low for them, no jobs too high for them, you know? And uh, I think that's important. Oh, it's, this is Seth. Hi Seth. How are you? Good. Hi. How old are you? <laughs> 10. Yeah. You look like a, a 10 year old version of your father. <laughs> He's a jokester. Yeah? yeah. Didn't, I was just hearing a story about you um, entertaining the, the posse while they did the dishes. <laughs> yeah, he loves football. Hey, do any, of the kids, 
Do any of the kids speak um, a language besides English? Uh, not me, not really. You know, my uh, oldest two they understand lots of Ukrainian, and you know, all of them Russian, right? Uh, lots of them understand uh, Dari, and some of them speak more or less. You know, depends on what you talk about to speak, but not not fluently, not fluently. Man, you know, may, maybe there's a, um, maybe when your kid, someone said you should write a book. Maybe when your kids could, uh, Seth could write a comedy about yeah, a, fa- a family of seven people, a family of nine people in Afghanistan. Yeah, often we sit down and we talk about funny moments in our life. And it's, you know, they all have, a, we have lots of those moments. You know? <laughs> Well, thank you. Tell your wife yeah. and your kids, thank you for your valuable time, your 53 yeah. minutes. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Anytime, man. Thank you for the hat. Yeah. And uh, if you're out this way, let's get together. I know last time you tried, that was my fault. But yeah. my, life is really, my life has really slowed down. Oh, another one. Oh, they yeah. look all alike. <laughs> hey, come on here, Kevin. That's the Let me see. Br- Let me see. The, hold on. Hold on. That's the only brown eye guy. What's his name? What's your name? Cademan. Cademan, you look like a, he looks like a professional baseball player. He looks like a pitcher. <laughs> yeah, that's the hat from uh, in Redding, California. There's a gym, Strong, Strong City Gym will get open, so they give us the hats. Their hats. And Redding, California is where your in-laws are? That's how you keep ending up there? No, there's our friends. It's our home for now. Okay. Church there. Yeah, my, yeah. yeah we're going to be in California only for a few days this time, and then we'll fly out from Sacramento. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you for staying in touch. Yeah, anytime. Awesome hey, a to quick, see you. Qu- yes. Question for you. Yes, Are you yes. still with the CrossFit or not? I, I am not. Okay, that's what I figured. Because yeah. when I send an email to you, it bounced back. Says, I bet you he's not anymore. Yeah, on, they, on October 1st, they let me go. Uh, I see. I did everything I could to try to stay, buddy. Uh, I'm going to be <laughs> talking. They, they, now they're contacting me. So I'm gonna, tomorrow, I'm going to have a Zoom call with them, too. Oh, so sweet. Gonna, from Colorado, so we'll see. With with, we'll see. with with some people on the affiliate team, or I think so. I, Kate, I think Kate something. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. We're, gonna, we're gonna find out. Okay, we're gonna sweet. find out if we're gonna be with CrossFit or not. <laughs> awesome. Well, what an amazing methodology. I mean, Greg, it, it's such a great gift, and um, yeah. yeah, I I, I love it. it. You know, I, I love I love CrossFit. I I don't like what it became a, of it with uh, people, but I still love. Uh, you know, whole whole idea of it. Uh, we we still do it every day. We still cross, CrossFit. You know. <laughs> of course. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, man. Yep. Give your love to my yeah, family. Thank you for your time. Yep. I'll talk yeah. to you soon. Yeah. Okay. Bye, bye, man. Bye.